Well, I'm Preben Vong. I'm the pastor here, and I have the joy of being so until uh, the search committee, how do I say this right? Get their act together and find a, a permanent one, right? No. <laughs> no, they're doing a fantastic job. They really, really are. I meet with them, and they're, they're praying hard. They're working hard. They're seeking God's, God's will for, for how to do this in the best way possible. So I hope you're enjoying also the listening sessions that are there and, and one that's coming also after the service in what we call the shed over here. But we're in the midst of a, a sermon series on prayer. And, and I want you to, to find uh, in the book of Daniel, if you can, right? So you get to the Old Testament, you get to all these really long uh, kind of prophets like, like uh, Jer- as Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And, and, you know, after Ezekiel, you get to, to Daniel. He's, he's still 12 chapters, but... Uh, but not quite as long as, as some of the others. But then you will find a person who is praying, and he's praying in a different way from some of the things that we have looked at earlier. And I, I want to start by simply saying this. We, in chapter 9, as you get ready for this, we need to be praying people. We need to be a praying church. You need to be part of a praying community. And if you're watching at home and, and, and that's why you can't call friends, if you can't get out of your home, call friends. If not, get out of your home and be here and, and, or be with other friends. You know, the community that you, you kind of hang with shapes your culture. It shapes your habits. It, it shapes the way you just live out your life, your daily walk. If you don't believe me, try to hang out with a lot of people that eat out a lot. You're going to get out, you're going to get to eat out a lot. You hang with a lot of people that, move, that watch movies a lot. What's going to happen to you? You're going to begin to watch movies a lot. Yeah, that's just how it works. Hang out with people who pray a lot. And you're going to become that person also. Ha- hang out with people that goes to church. And you'll become also, that, that is just how it works, and, and so I want to kind of in- encourage you with that, uh, even as we begin to look at this here, right? There's an old adage that says, tell me who you hang with, and I'll tell you who you are. And there's just a lot to be said for that. Uh, the Proverbs, of course, say it, say it even stronger, right? If I, I can quote directly here, the one who walks with the wise will become wise, right? The, the one who holds a company uh, with the fools well, I wouldn't say what he says about that, right? Uh, you'll become a fool. So as we look at, at, um, at the Daniel text here in chapter 9, uh, we are moving into kind of here praying based on God's character. I could have said based, praying, trusting God's character. In chapter 9, it says here, in the first year of Darius, Darius the son of uh, Ahasuerus, a Mede by birth, who was made king over the Chaldean kingdom. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the books according to the word of the Lord to the prophet Jeremiah that the number of years for the desolation of Jerusalem would be 70. So I turned my attention to the Lord uh, God to seek him by prayer and petition with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned, done wrong, acted wickedly, rebelled, and turned away from your commandments and your ordinances. We have not listened to your servants and prophets who spoke in your name to our kings, leaders, fathers, and all the people of the land. Lord, Righteousness belongs to you, but this day public shame belongs to us. And then if we go to verse 17. Therefore, our God, hear the prayer and the petition of of your servant. Make your your face shine on your desolate sanctuary for the Lord's sake. Listen closely, my God. 
and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolation and the city that bears your name. For we are not presenting our petitions before you based on our righteous acts, but based on your abundant compassion. Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, listen and act. My God, for your own sake, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. You know, there's something incredible about this text, right? We, we have dealt with other texts, like when we dealt with Genesis uh, 18 earlier and, and, and looked at, at Daniel, I mean, at, at, at Abraham, who was trying to pray to understand God. And we have this example of God kind of talking to Abraham. We saw it also last Sunday with, with Jacob at, at the river Jabbok, and we saw this conversation. And sometimes that's just hard for us to relate to. Although we realize we need to understand that in certain ways, and we talked about that. If you didn't have time to be here last Sunday, go back and find, find uh, uh, our, our conversation with that text also from, from last Sunday and, and the previous Sundays on this. And sometimes we just say, you know, I don't have these kind of uh, special, uh, you know, I don't see visions. I, I, I don't hear God speak to me in any kind of very clear way. It, it just seems too abstract for me. I, I can't quite relate. Well, if that's you, look at this text. There's something about what happens here with Daniel that speaks directly to how many of us kind of see and meet God. His very beginning here. Look at verse 2, right? In the first year of, the, of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from my reading of Scripture I understood when I sat before that word. And, and when I did that, I was so gripped or arrested by that word that, that it was like it leaped off from it, its pages and it put me into this intense prayer. It was, it was like something in my heart that I got to seek God. Just look at it. I turned my attention to the Lord, and I had to seek him in prayer, petition, and fasting, and sackcloth, and ashes, intensity of prayer. But when you think about it for just a moment, there's not all that much of a difference, really, is there, in, in, in the way that, that, that Abraham interacted with God and, and in the way that, that Daniel uh, interacted with God, at least not in a deeper way that this is the experience when you think about it. It's the same God. It's the same God who wants to engage with his people. It's the same God who wants people to hear and know his will and follow it. And if you think about it a little bit, it may even come through clearer in the way we see it with Daniel and in the way we sometimes experience it than what we see with people like Abraham and Jacob, at least in the way we were, ex we were able to experience it. Think about it for a moment. See, if you can follow me here, if you have a, a vision or a very strong spiritual experience with God, which is a good thing. Don't be, mishear me here. It is a great thing we want to have that. But, but what happens with that is, of course, it is subjective. It is my experience, and it is very important to me. And then as time goes, if, if it becomes just a memory, something that happened a long time ago, if it is not a, an ongoing occurrence that I meet with God and I listen to God, it becomes a memory. And then once it's a memory, it, it's a matter of what I remember about it. And, and, and do I remember it right? I even talked to someone at one time and said, I'm not so sure. I had this great experience with God, but it is decades ago, and, and I'm not really sure what it was that I heard anymore. Not so when you sit before God's unchangeable word and, and the, the words of the page leave up and grab your heart and your soul and say, hey, I'm speaking to you. Look at it right here. Even Jesus, 
is reminding his listener about the importance of holding on to, anchoring one's walk with God in the Holy Scripture. He tells a parable. And in that parable, he talks about, you know, life after his poor man, Lazarus, rich man, and then they go to very different places in the afterlife. The rich man is not with God, and he is suffering. And, and he said, would you send someone from here to my brothers that they may know? And what did Jesus say? Jesus responds, as he's telling this parable, he responds by saying, if they would not listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not even going to listen if someone comes back from the dead. Are you hearing me here? That's the point that we're seeing it. Just like with Daniel, that God had given him the written word, so also with us, by the power and illumination of the Holy Spirit, that word from God will come alive in our own individual situation. And it will come alive to such a degree that as it just was with Daniel, that it says that he was gripped or arrested or whatever word you will use to say, to explain what happened here by God's word in such a way that it wrapped itself around his mind and it kind of thrust him into this prayer. It's like this thought will not let go of me. And what really happened was here that there was a tension in his mind between what he read as the promises of God and what he experienced as the reality of his life. Are you hearing this? Daniel saw a tension between what he read as the promises of God and then what he experienced as a reality of life. And it is in that tension that he's lifting up this prayer. It comes with this submissive force, this open-hearted question to God. You know, look at it for a moment and think about your own Bible reading. I had to do that a little bit. Just look at it. He's reading. You know, God said in the book of Jeremiah that Israel or Jerusalem would only be under capture for about 70 years. You know, well, okay. <laughs> There's so many things in Scripture that we read that we don't really latch onto or that we don't really kind of listen to. There's so many promises that we haven't really tried to understand, so they don't, it's just yet another promise from God, and it doesn't disturb us. Why should we let the tension between what we read as God's promise and God's word and then our own experience of it, why should we let that force us on our knees in an intense prayer and commitment? Well, maybe that's a good question. It's certainly an important question. Well, with Daniel, it was because the tension between his reality and God's promises was just unbearable. He, he couldn't stand it. He was beyond himself. He knew that God's faithfulness was unchangeable and unassailable. He knew that God would never renege on his promises. So why were they in this situation? What has gone wrong? How had they been unfaithful to God? There was something that didn't come back together in the right way. Of course, you're thinking maybe, well, this Daniel, he's specially godly and I'm not there. Don't do that. He's just a regular dude. He just had his regular life with all the difficulties that came his way and he was trying to find what it meant to be a faithful follower of the Lord Almighty. I, I think I can find a way of explaining that in, 
in even daily terms, think of it this way. Jesus speaks to us through Scripture, right? And, and, and he commands his followers to forgive one another. And then you get to think of Peter or Penny or Joe and Jill, or George and Joyce or whatever, and you know, you know, you're supposed to forgive them, but it's just hard. They're weird. And, you know, your emotion won't quite get you there. And yet, Scripture is there, like with this branding iron, trying to give you an identity about who you belong to. And it says, just like I forgave you, you should forgive one another. Or even as we heard earlier, uh, when, when Justin was praying, right, think about the testimony. You know good and well, and there's, a, there's this friend at, at work or, or this friend at school, and they need to hear your testimony. They need to have a word about God. It would release them in so many ways, and, and yet you're, you're kind of quiet because you don't know how they're going to react, and they're going to think you're weird, or, or you don't want to step into their private sphere or whatever. And yet, Scripture is right there trying to give you this identity, right? And, and it says here, he who will confess me before man, I will confess before the Father. Or, or, you know, I will give you power and you can become my witnesses. The tension between the word of God and his promises and the reality that we experience. That's what threw and thrusted Daniel into this intense prayer. Are we hearing this? You know, the first thing we learn in Daniel's school of prayer is that when we experience that tension, that we should not run away from it. We should not skate over it. We should not just kind of shrug our shoulders. But we should let the energy from that tension be channeled into an intensive prayer. A prayer where the purpose is to adjust our reality to the promises and the word of God. That's what we find here. And, and think of it this way, and I want to kind of add that if you're not aware of that. Daniel is sitting in Babylon. He was not part of the pain of Jerusalem. He wasn't even part of causing it. He's been a good guy, and he's way over there. But it does not even occur to him in the flicker of a second to transform his prayer life into a religious ceremony where he would just say the right thing without being willing to pay the right price. This is what was so real for Daniel. They had trained him in Chaldean thought. That is the way they think in Babylon, right? Their worldview, so to speak, but he never changed his life to their ways. So the question is, and, and I'm going to kind of talk to you about this for just a moment here, what was it that was so real for Daniel? It was God himself. It was God's character. Daniel trusted God. That's the point. And maybe I can give you another kind of contemporary example to, to show what that kind of thing is. Imagine that a friend or a family member, that one you trust completely, one who is always punctuary, one who is always, you know, very conscientious about letting you know things and all that, She's asking you to come pick her up from the airport. She will land on Tuesday at 425 on, on plane AA 1497, whatever. And you're there. Plane lands. She's not coming out. And you get worried. You, you, you walk over to the information desk. What's, what's happening? Was there something else going on? Uh, was there another plane? Did they not board everybody? Was she on there? Can you tell me something? 
And you just get really worried. And, and then you, you know, wait around and say, maybe she took a different plane and we're not able. You try to call the phone and there's no answer. And you get really, really scared. And now you're kind of concerned and you're running around. You try to leave messages where normally you can't leave messages. You run home. You call all the friends you have. Have you all heard from her? Why are you concerned? Because you trust her, yes? You know she would never do that without calling you and letting you know I didn't make the plane or something happened, I won't be there. You know, don't worry about it, I'm okay. Yes? You trust her, yes? Then imagine another thing. You know, another friend uh, asked you to come and pick her up. But she's kind of, you know, bohemian a little bit, you know, kind of fly by the seat of the pants, not really paying attention to things, and say, you know, I'd like to kind of be picked up at the airport. Can you come get me? And you drive out there, as good friend as you are, and, and she's not on the plane. And you're thinking, maybe she got the date wrong. Maybe, you know, just the time, and, you know, no big deal. She probably just took a different plane. Or maybe she flew in early and just forgotten. She even asked you to come pick her up. And you don't worry about it. You just drive back home. Two different ways, right? You hear me? Question is, which way do we look at God's promise? Maybe I should just let you think about that for a moment. Daniel had no doubt about the trustworthiness of God's promises. He trusted God. He knew God's character. His whole prayer was based on that. His whole prayer was kind of built around that very reality that he could trust God's faithfulness. He was real to him. It was not just something going on in his mind. Just look at what he's saying here in verse 4. I pray to the Lord, and then he said, O oh Lord, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant. Verse 7, uh, Lord, right, the righteousness belongs to you. Verse 9 that we didn't read before, compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord. Focused on who he is. Think about that. What is your trust level when it comes to God? And how does that play into the way you experience the tension between what you read in his word and what you see in your life? Maybe we can even try to take a step further down into this. What was it truly that motivated him? Look at verse 19. It's kind of an interesting thing. He said, Lord, hear, forgive, Lord. Listen and act for your own sake. He's somewhat concerned, at least he's expressing concern about God's Reputation, if you will. God is known as the one who can be trusted. And Daniel could not even bear the thought that people would turn God into a laughing stock, that, that they would just not consider him anything worthy, that, that he apparently didn't have the power to change people's lives. Even worse, imagine if the people around concluded, well, they worship this God, and other people worship that God, and he's just one of many. Daniel could not bear that, that the God, the creator of heaven and earth, would not be able to create a true change in people's lives. That's where he attaches this. And I'm not sure if we always understand that kind of passion, 
And oh, I know I kind of had to grapple with that a little bit. Is, is God really dependent upon what people think about him? Not at all. Not even close, friends. Can, can people make him greater or smaller by, by their actions? No way. But that's not what is in his prayer either, friends. God does not need to worry about what people think about him. He is sovereign in his power. But although he doesn't need to worry about it, God still remains eager to be involved in the actions and the well-being of human beings. And that's the background for Daniel's appeal to God's loving care for his people. Daniel's own love for God and his love for, for, for all the people around him gave him a motivation, even an impassion for God's honor and reputation. What Daniel is really saying here is that, God, for the sake of people, I ask that you will be aware of how people think about you. They need you. Please help them to fear your name and to recognize your greatness. Make those who call you by name so dedicated to you that it gives evidence of your presence in their lives. That's really what drives it. I hope we're getting this, friends. I hope we really are. Because it, it speaks to me, and it, I trust it will speak to you. As I sit before this text, I have to ask God, what level is my prayer on? I'm not talking about your ability to formulate yourself. That, that has nothing to do with the depth of your prayer. What we learn from Daniel is that the quality of your cry to God finds his origin in your understanding of who he truly is and how well he can be trusted. It's part of your growth, your spiritual growth. You know, when we first become Christians, it, it's spiritual growth and and normal human growth is not all that different when it comes to that. You know, when you first become a Christian and you're immature kind of in thing, you, your whole focus is, is on yourself and your old desires and your own walk with God, which is fine. A, a newborn baby is also has no concern other than him or herself. They just, yeah, when they want something. And then as you grow, you become aware of the need of other people. And, and that's part of growth. That's part of spiritual growth as well. But as you continue to grow and, and walk toward maturity, your prayer life is moving, you know, further away, not only just for others, but also now you're focusing on the kingdom of God. May I understand God's will. This is exactly what Jesus taught us to pray. May your will happen on earth just like it happens in heaven. May your kingdom be revealed and become manifest among us. That's really what that text or that line says. Let's think about this. Daniel's experience of God was based on his rock solid conviction that God can be trusted. On Christ the solid ground I stand all other sand. All of the ground, I should say, is sinking sand. Just think about this. Let me end by just one brief illustration. You remember David and Goliath. So David is their little shepherd boy. And he stands before Goliath, the giant of a fighter. And then he says, David says, you come to me with sword and spears and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies, the God of the ranks of Israel. You have defied him. Today, the Lord will hand you over to me, and then the whole world will know 
that Israel has a God and this whole world will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves. The battle is the Lord's. You should be gasping by wonder. How is it even possible to trust God that much? Little shepherd boy, giant trained fighter. Lord, I ask that you will grant to us the kind of prayer life that characterized Daniel. The kind of prayer life that grows from a deep, deep, deep conviction that you can be trusted. That what you speak is truth. That the foundation you give us to walk on is solid. And Father, when we see a tension between what you've said and our experience, would you call us in to use that tension into a passionate prayer for you to make that difference disappear that we may learn to trust you and walk in the ways you call us to walk in Lord I know that there are some here I sense it that need to hear that particular word from Daniel this morning to everyone that, that this is would you speak with clarity May they forget my words and just cling to yours. Lord, there might be some that, that may even not know any of your promises, may not have really cracked your book, may not know what it means to call you Lord, Speak to them, Lord, and say, I, I will give you a foundation for your life. Reorient it, because I'm God, and I can be trusted. Lord, those who are thinking that they can be just as well be Christian on their own, let them recognize that they need to be in a community that shapes them. Need to be in a group where people pray, where people worship, where people orient their lives according to the promises and the faithfulness of God. Do your work among us right now, Lord, we ask. In your powerful name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen.